yet. Also, um, welcome uh, our member from the Attorney General's office, um, Jeff Hochstetler um, and Janice Clark, um, who do an awful lot of work um, to help us through all of our uh, issues and and uh, report making. And um, very importantly, uh, also Lisa Kirshner, who is our ombudsman um, uh, that runs that part of the compliance program. Um, I think everybody's gotten a copy of the, or at least all the members have gotten a copy of the draft of the annual report uh, sent out several weeks ago, and uh, we've everybody's had a chance to um, have a you know uh, raise any questions, issues um, at the uh, in the intervening weeks, um, and of particular interest and uh, really a main part of this all is uh, the discussion with, with regard to our recommendations to the legislature for um, increasing the authority of our board so that we can be, uh, we can fill a very big void that uh, is out there. As everybody is aware, uh, our jurisdiction only um, is that we uh, are there to adjudicate um, any uh, um, claim uh, that a above three hundred and fifty dollars um, that costs one hundred three hundred fifty dollars, uh, we can only get involved on those uh, claims that that uh, such charges are unreasonable. Um, so, um, what we want to do. Um, is to increase our authority so that we can really make a difference into the goals of the uh, PIA board, which were initial, initially uh, uh, made law in, around, in or around 1970. Um, a few, just a, kind of a background there, uh, which is part of the report, um, it was, uh, it was um, resolved, well, when it started out, when we started out in 1970, um, they, they, they created the law so that the people, citizens can go and see what is uh, in the uh, records of the government. Um, and uh, in 19, or excuse me, 2015, our board was created to further that, however, further that goal. However, with the restrictions that we have, we can do very little and uh, basically all the difficulties, all the difficult cases get uh, have to be uh, adjudic not adjudicated, but you have the ombudsman uh, taking charge to try to get some kind of an agreement. Um, and that's often not able to be accomplished. So um, we're asking in this legislative, uh, in the House Bill uh, 502 and the Senate Bill 590, which are kind of mirror uh, images of themselves uh, for that authority. So that's where we are right now. We're hopeful that um, we can get this to the legislature, get it to a vote, get it to the governor, and uh, have it made law. But that's, uh, you know, we have to cover that, all those bases. And then hopefully we will be able to uh, take a really significant part in adjudicating these cases where there's a conflict as to whether there's um, 
the, the asker is asking too much or unreasonable or in cases where the uh, governmental uh, side has not, won't cooperate with the citizen that's seeking information. So that's where we are right now. And uh, I think that to embellish this, it's uh, important to bring in the ombudsman um, or ombudswoman in this case, uh, Lisa Kirchner, who has a, um, a very big role in all of this and who can um, elaborate on just what I was talking about. Oh, so Lisa, well, yeah, go ahead. Did you want me to chime in, uh, John, now? Yes, go ahead. With some thoughts. Um, well, as, as you all know, we worked together um, very closely last year on, on the report and uh, the agency survey that we did, um, the analysis of that data, and then in articulating our recommendations uh -huh. and uh, moving forward into the legislative session with a proposed bill, um, I have said, um, uh, both before this board at its meeting last year um, and uh, this past legislative session, I had the opportunity to testify along with um, Darren Wigfield, um, one of the board members, um, about the, the, the importance of this initiative um, to the operation of the PIA overall. Um, speaking really from the point of view of my program, which, um, as I think um, all of our attendees are probably aware, it, it is a, our program mandate is to try to um, uh, facilitate on a very, uh, on an entirely voluntary basis, resolution of disputes that come up over access to public records. And our program has some very positive features, I think, and some strengths, which include that when we can engage and, um, with, with the parties um, and, uh, um, and there's the capacity on both ends um, to engage in a meaningful discussion, we have the ability to come up with um, uh, uh, creative solutions that work for both parties. And that can be very exciting. So I think one of the one of the benefits of the program is it has the potential to be to bring flexibility to problem solving. Um, one of the downsides uh, of our program is um, that uh, that I feel very acutely um, is that in instances where we're not able to achieve some kind of agreement or resolution by consensus on a voluntary basis the uh, it, it's not always the requester, but usually it's the requester, really have no effective accessible access to a decision maker who can call the balls and the strikes um, and, and who has the authority to say, uh, thou shalt produce the record if, if that's the case, or uh, no, you may not produce the record um, if that's the case. And um, uh, and, and there is a there's a very um, significant need for that, not just for those matters that can't be resolved, but I think for the development of the law and the perception that um, uh, that it's being taken seriously. So for all those reasons, I fully support um, the, the board's work and initiative in this regard and um, uh, your comments, uh, John, are, are very consistent with what my experience has been. So I look forward to working with you as we go forward into uh, the 2021 session. Thanks very much, um, Lisa. Um, so just to um, see the background a little bit of this more, we did actually appear before the House Committee and the Senate Committee um, and I think the presentations were very positive. Um, and I think everybody is, um, uh, was on, or certainly leaning our way to, um, adopt the, uh, pro uh what proposals that we had. Um, unfortunately, uh, as with everything else, um, the, 
uh, virus uh, has kind of uh, put everything on hold. And uh, we're hoping to, with the next legislative session, to uh, be able to bring that forward and actually uh, have that approved by the Senate and the House so that we can then move forward with this with the government. So um, it, it's, it's uh, we're right on the, you know, right on uh, the edge of getting this accomplished and I'm feeling very positive about it and um, feel very positive about the fact that our, um, our committee can really uh, make a difference in this, uh, in this whole field and uh, she, brighten. And just in all honesty, she probably won't know what the, what that uh, Maryland quality, healthcare quality entity that she doesn't have any jurisdiction over that so she probably won't excuse know. me please mute your phone yeah thank you um so um i think with with uh with that um i would like to have a um vote of um approval of the uh fifth annual report and um after that then I would like to uh, ask if anyone has any questions. But first, um, I would like to uh, poll our committee uh, as to whether an up or down on with regard to the report or any changes they would like to uh, address. No changes to the report. changes from Renee Swalford. Thank you. Um, Darren? Uh, no changes for me, thank you. Um, Deborah? No changes, no changes. Okay, and I feel the same way. So, uh, um, all in favor of um, the report as drafted and circulated, um, ask for a, uh, a motion to that effect. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, this is Deborah Moore Carter. I move approval of the fifth annual and annual report. Okay, and a second. A second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Uh, any aye. Uh, any um, objections? Okay. Thank you very much for that. Um, that concludes that part of this part of the meeting, uh, but I would like to open up uh, any uh, for anybody to sign on and um, ask any questions that they may have. Um, this is an open meeting, so um, if you would like to chime in, uh, please, please do, and we'll try to address what your uh, issues may be. Let me. I'll, I'll jump in here real quick. Um, I think we had a, we had thought that maybe submitting written comments in the chat function might be the easiest way to uh, to deal with it, rather than. Um, well, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So um, please, yeah, please submit by the chat function um, in Teams, which so, you can find down in the toolbar. So Jeff, I found two questions in the chat. Um, Mr. David has asked if he could get a copy of the report. The, yeah, the report now that it's been approved will be um, will be published uh, as soon as it's finalized. The deadline for that is um, October first, but I anticipate um, the board can publish that much sooner. And Laura Anderson Wright has asked if this legislation is to expand the PA Compliance Board's authority. Is it to be reintroduced next session? Oh, if this legislation to expand is to be reintroduced next session, will it also include a fiscal stream, for example, funding to support the significant implication implementation costs that the state agencies will face? Okay. Hmm. Uh, I, I think that part of the um, re reports, um, or part of the, this is, Yes, I think that's going to, our, our view is that 
it would probably take two um, employees, two members, um, and not members, two employees uh, to um, administer uh, the change. John, can I, uh, this is Lisa Kirshner, can I chime in? Um, yeah, sure. I, I understood uh, uh, Laura Anderson Wright's question to be directed to whether um, uh, uh, funding would be provided to cover agencies, uh, any additional costs agencies might have that, that would result from um, the implementation of, of an expanded um, board authority. And uh, my understanding of the, um, uh, the legislative process um, is simply that there is a process by which a fiscal note is prepared um, that um, mm -hmm. attempts to quantify uh, uh, the cost to the state um, and the and affected parties um, uh, of implementing any proposed bill. So there was a fiscal note prepared, um, for example, last session uh, that dealt with the uh, recommendation uh, the recommendations we made. And I would anticipate that if a new bill is introduced, that same process will be followed and and a fiscal note would be prepared uh, in conjunction with it. That fiscal note is published and it's made available to committee members and so forth. So my understanding is that's part and parcel of the, of the whole entire process. Okay. And, and this is if Darren, I could, if I can, oh, go ahead, Darren. Uh, the thanks, Jeff. Uh, my understanding of the intent of the bills, the bill that we were supporting would have given more oversight of the PIA uh, by the board, but the bills would not expand any of the responsibilities on the agencies. The PIA wouldn't have any additional requirements of the agency. So if agencies are complying with the PIA now, then there should be no incurred cost to continue complying with it should that bill, as had been introduced, uh, be passed. And I'll point out that the fiscal note for the specific bills um, that were recommended by the board and that um, will be recommended next year, uh, the, the fiscal note did not have any additional costs beyond the two um, additional staff to the attorney general's office to man the expanded jurisdiction. Um, Go ahead. This is Janice. I'm just noticing that there's a, a little bit of debate back and forth in the chat, and I didn't know how how much um, if if everyone could just follow, maybe pop the uh, populate the chat on their um, view, uh, and 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 then if we, I guess the best way to handle this is if we if the board does not address your question directly during the meeting, we may follow up with you directly after. Does that sound right, Jeff? I think it makes sense to read, yeah, read new um, new comments. Um, I'm not sure that back and forth is that effective on this on this platform. Were there any other um, questions that came up through the chat? Um, most of the chat, from what I gather and again I'm, I'm not perfect um i would say it's all whether or not the legislation makes sense who's supporting enforcement who's not and and what the what who how this how the state agencies are going to pay for it i i see one question um from michael david what caused a state law the pia to end up with no enforcement options worth speaking of um who imposes enforcement. I don't know if any of you have um, any comments on that question. I, well, I, our report address, this is Lisa again, our report addresses that, uh, at least in part, um, when the board, when the idea for the board was proposed in 2015, the original proposal called for the board to have full jurisdiction over PIA disputes. Um, uh, during the course of the 2015 session, the bill was amended in such a way that the jur board's jurisdiction was cut back to, um, to limit it to hearing only fee disputes where 
the, the amount in controversy is $350 or more, and the nature of the complaint is that the fee is unreasonable. That is the sole jurisdiction the board has pursuant to the 2015 uh, amendments to the original proposal. Um, prior to prior to that legislation, there was a, a an administrative appeal process through the um, administrative office. Um, oh, help me out here. The name of the um, uh, entity. It's it, it's an Office of Administrative Hearings. Right. So that existed for certain state agencies that participated uh, in that dispute resolution process. Um, that was eliminated. That option was eliminated in the 2015 amendment, presumably because the original proposal called for the board to have full jurisdiction. What happened, though, by the end of the 2015 session is that the board's jurisdiction was cut and the hearings office jurisdiction was not reinstated or expanded. So that left a net situation whereby uh, the only option, someone someone who is in need of enforcement, whether it's an agency or a requester, the only option available is to go to court. If there are no more comments on that question, I have a new question to raise from chat. Um, this is from Lori. To Mr. West and the board, who do we write to specifically in order to request approval, request approval of the requested increased authority of the board? Um, as you discussed, uh, House Bill 502, Senate Bill 590 um, from last session. Is she asking who to um, go to in the legislature uh, with regard to that, or is it, or something? I, I, um, yeah, I, I believe that's the general question is how, um, how she may be able to register her support um, for your approval. Yeah, I think it's, uh, there's a public record as to who the sponsors are on the Senate side and on the House side. And I think that's that would be the appropriate um, way to approach it. Is that... I believe that it, uh, she, she thanks you. Okay. So um, we have another question here um, from A. Ortiz. My experience with PIA, uh, my PIA request was approved in May 2019. The agency is yet to complete the process. Um, agency keeps giving me the runaround and there is little recourse to actually make the agency comply with the PIA. So that's, I suppose, more of a comment than a question. Didn't know if anyone else wanted to chime in on that. That seems to be all of the questions at the moment or comments. Mm -hmm. um, I think that if there are any additional, uh, it could be submitted um, in writing and we'll um, certainly welcome any um, other questions or insights that want, uh, someone might have. Okay, um, Jeff, I think that in, uh, concludes this. I would like to, unless uh, there's somebody else that has any comments to make from um, from the board, I just go around the horn there. Um, Deborah, did you have anything else that you wanted to add? No, thank you. Uh, Renee? No. Darren? Darren? No, thank you. All right. Um, I did want to make. Uh, I did want to say something though um, before we close um, about Jeff Hoffbedler, who is uh, our representative um, in the Attorney General's office, and who has been such a really wonderful support um, for our. Uh, he's made things a lot easier. He with uh, Janice Clark. And um, he is moving on to um, another career, uh, this one with uh, Baltimore City. And, uh, but before going 
and uh, certainly we all do wish him well. I um, want to say thanks to Jeff for all of his efforts on behalf of the PIACB. Um, all his input, ideas, his judgments. Uh, we're going to miss you. We'll miss you badly, and uh, but we do wish you wish you well. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Butch. That's very kind, and I will uh, certainly miss working with with all of you, and wish um, wish you each individually and as a board the best of best of luck in the future. Thank you. Thanks. Thank, thank you, you Jeff. Um, Thank you yeah. for all of your hard work. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Well, and I'd like to thank the board for the work that they do. We, we, we really spend a, a good deal of time on uh, trying to implement um, and help with the process of uh, open government. And uh, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's been a little challenge sometimes, but I think we all just... Um, um, do it. We do it for uh, a labor of love to uh, try to help out uh, the citizens of Maryland. So uh, that being said, um, I think we can close the meeting and look forward to the next one. All right. Is, Do we see. need a motion to close? Um, I move well, to adjourn. Okay. <laughs> uh, I got a second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you very much. <laughs> we are adjourned. Renee, don't don't go to laughing at me. <laughs> <laughs> Have a good one, everybody. Thank you, Thank you everybody. Bye. 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 Thank you very much. Bye now. Thank <laughs> you.